This is Design Safe Radio, where natural hazards researchers strive to make our society more resilient to everything nature throws at us. Hello, welcome to another episode of Design Safe Radio. I'm your host, Dan Zayner, and uh, here with me today, we've got Andre Barbosa uh, from Oregon State University, although uh, this week he is down in what normally would be sunny San Diego, but <laughs> we're just uh, talking before we got started about the uh, atmospheric river that has dumped, what was it, like 14 inches of rain in two days? Yeah, here in Southern California. It was pretty impressive. Phew. I... <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it, it's quite amazing the uh, the amount of water that you can get dumped in just a short amount of time, and and it really puts into perspective a lot of the reasons why um, the Nary Network exists and why we do what we do. Although uh, you're working on more seismic resilience than uh, <laughs> atmospheric resilience, yeah, but but worried about sustainability for sure. Yeah, exactly. So. Um, really looking forward to talking about uh, some of your projects, but uh, give us a, a you know, 60, 90 second intro and then we'll uh, get into what you're doing down in Southern California. Sure. Um, so under Barbos, I'm a structural engineer. I've been at uh, Oregon State University for about 12 years and I have done my PhD actually here at UC San Diego. So it was um, nice to come back and then now uh, work on this project here on, on the site. Um, but yeah, I've been looking at um, different products, uh, reinforced concrete, of course, also mass timber, which brings us today to this conversation. And um, and I was fortunate enough that when I joined Oregon State University, it was the really the boom. Um, this is like early 2012, where there was a lot of interest, growing interest in the Pacific Northwest to start looking further at mass timber. And um, yeah, it's it's been an amazing ride. Um, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of interest. There's a lot of need um, that is also tied to climate change, but really also tied to these opportunities for creating more rural rural jobs, workforce development, tying both sides of the equation uh, to create sustainable, but also you know job opportunities in our Pacific Northwest. Yeah, I was just talking to an architect yesterday about a, uh, a mass timber project going on here in Eugene for um, they just changed some of the local uh, regulations about building uh, auxiliary domestic units. I think that's what ADU stands for, but you know, ADUs. small small houses in your backyard so you can rent out, right? And there's a huge interest in doing mass timber um, for that because you can get most of your building prefabricated the site construction is a whole lot quicker than a stick built house. And obviously you've got the sustainability aspect there too. Um, and it's just really cool to see that finally starting to gain a little bit of momentum on the residential front, uh, at least here in Eugene, it's right. as well. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And provide project... alternatives for people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So your project as uh, the Neary converging design is kind of your, the envelope for your project. Um, Talk about maximizing functional recovery and integrating those sustainable des- building design principles we started talking about. Can you kind of unpack that, what that means uh, for people like earthquake engineers and our, our friends, the architects, um, and we'll go from there. Yeah, so um, yeah, those, those two words, converging design, are really because we are trying to bring these two um, relatively new ideas um, of course, there's a lot of work on them separately, but now bringing them together and converging into one design methodology. So on the functional recovery side, maybe just explain a little bit that that deals mainly with coming up with a new design paradigm, um, not only around earthquakes, but we're focusing on earthquakes here. Um, and in a nutshell, our codes today, our codes and standards are written really for life safety. That is written so engineers can produce building designs that enhance life safety. For example, after a big earthquake, right, people should be able to evacuate buildings without harm and safety. So the no loss of life, that's really the goal. Um, but what's been happening is that after these major earthquakes, um, then buildings sometimes have to have very expensive repairs, long repair times. People can't go back to their houses, can't shelter in place, and many buildings may even have to be demolished after these big earthquakes. So um, even though, you know, for critical buildings, we had already thought about functional 
functionality, making sure hospitals were functional, making sure schools um, were functional, um, really our building design codes are, are, that's not how they are written today. Right. But our society is not too happy about that um, yeah. as we get more of these big events. Um, you know, there's this idea and, you know, folks do their households and businesses should be able to recover quickly after big, these big major earthquakes. And so functional recovery, which is, you know, these two complicated words put together, um, is really trying to envision codes and we, but not only we, me, the we is the big we engineering community, um, both researchers and practicing engineers um, are starting to think, how do we write code? So not, we don't, it's, so we still achieve safety and life safety, but we can start having building designs where we have more acceptable recovery times, where, um, you know, really can we have post-earthquake reoccupancy and can we minimize the recovery time so that businesses and people can get back? Right. Um, so that's a long-winded um, answer maybe for your question, Dan, but uh, functional recovery. That's one aspect. The other aspect is sustainability, right? And sustainable building design principles. So what we're looking at is looking at materials that reduce environmental impacts. Um, and that's, you know, for the same function, um, if you have two competing materials, which are the materials that reduce, um, you know, impact on human health, impact on the environment, and that's over their life cycle, right? That's really what we're looking at. Um, with mass timber and with timber in general, but now especially with mass timber, um, we can start uh, and mass timber, be it um, these big blue laminated beams that maybe people are more used to thinking about or other new engineered wood products or relatively new engineered wood products like cross laminated timber or mass ply panels. So some of those have that are recent and new engineered wood products are now in a way competing, but also providing solutions for slabs, for walls and um, for prefabrication. So um, what, that's on the sustainability side, that's what we're looking at is some of those materials and reducing the environmental impact of the materials, but also looking at resilience, the word that you had brought in initially, um, looking at resilience, looking at after these big earthquakes, if buildings are more resilient, um, then they have less damage. If they have less damage, we have less new products, new materials we have to bring in for repairs, or we don't have to demolish and send things to landfill. So we're also exploring resilience as part of sustainability in our in our side of the of the coin here. Um, so uh, you know, basically that there's one more little aspect on sustainability that we're thinking about, um, which is what's the end of life of these buildings? Um, can we reuse some of these elements, and can we? come up with design principles that allow us to reuse some of those members um, after, you know, that first design and the building was used for that first main function. As our societies change um, and, you know, you look at buildings 100 years ago, very different functionally than buildings today, what would they look like in 30, 40, 50 years? Um, so if we are going to adapt our building designs, can we reuse some of those materials? What do we need to do? There's a lot of questions that we don't have answers for mm -hmm. that we're trying to uh, think about in our project. Yeah, it's been it's been really cool to see that you're already doing some of that um, with just the test specimens that you're you're using. And um, can you speak to some of that that you're already putting into into practice? I know you've been finding interesting ways to reuse some of the, the pieces of test specimens already. <laughs> right um, on the reuse specifically. Right. Um, yeah. So. Uh, First of all, uh, one big thing we are doing is we're reusing a specimen. Um, there was a lot of work on a 10-story building um, that colleagues, Shilling Pei, Colorado State, uh, sorry, Colorado School of Mines, and other colleagues worked on for about a year um, here on the shake table. And then our first reuse was actually reuse of a specimen. Um, so, you know, part of our proposal was we will take off top four stories and then we will reuse 
to do more research, a six story version of the building, which is the one that's right behind me over here. Um, so that was that's part of the reuse story. Um, but yes, what you were alluding to, I think, is more of what do we do with the top four stories and what do we even do with the six stories once we're done with our project? So we're working very closely with architects both here um, at UCSD um, and also in the Pacific Northwest University of Oregon, uh, finding opportunities to reuse the materials. Um, there's some challenges, um, especially when it comes to regrading structurally some of these materials. Um, even though we do have the information of how these are, you know, they've been out in the, they've been weathering and there's questions, you know, what is the capacity now? How can they be reused? Um, and some structural engineers, for example, don't feel as comfortable. Some architects ask questions, how can we reprocess the materials? Um, so that's one aspect and of, of the challenges, but of opportunities, uh, there's currently one project um, that uh, the architect here, uh, Teddy Cruz at UC San Diego, is working on, which is to re to reuse the linear elements, the beams and the columns, um, for um, an office building, for a refuge for colonies um, right across the border here in Tijuana, and um, he's just finalizing you know details of how that can actually be done but we've been working with him on the design side to make it possible. So yeah, it's been it's been a great um, part of the project, even beyond maybe what we had imagined initially mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the opportunities, but, uh, but yeah, just thinking about reuse, sustainability of the buildings and, you know, it would, it would be a shame to have to put some of these to landfill because they're good. Um, materials that we can reuse, but it also allows us to think about uh, for the future how to better design buildings for reuse as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it's such a, a really interesting um, way to to think about it from you know the scientific community and our and our responsibility as uh, you know part of that to um, pra practice what we're preaching, right? Of of these sustainable design exactly. principles and not just you know toss away a perfectly good, uh, you know, or, or usable material, uh, just because we're done with the test specimen. And so it's, it's really right. great to, to, you know, as, as the name of your project suggests, converge these, these ideas together, uh, to provide example for other scientists and engineers going forward of, you know, how might we, even in our testing, as well as getting into practice, um, reuse these specimens for, for other uses when they've, uh, you know, finished the life cycle of their in, uh, original intent. Um, <laughs> So speaking of some of those elements, uh, there, you got a lot of interesting things to to change that that tall wood building uh, that for, from you didn't just take the four stories off the top. Um, now you're looking at uh, some new uh, te uh, technologies, some new design techniques. Um, so for those who aren't experts in structural design or, or engineering, can you talk about things like those those U shaped flexural plates on the sides of the walls? And some of those buckling restraint braces, those are a couple of those uh, things that you're looking at and how they interact with rocking walls. And can you tell us about uh, right. how your what your research team is looking to see with those two specifically? Yeah, um, no, that's a great question. So we, we have three phases in the project. And one of the phases uses a structural system that you were mentioning, has the U-shaped flexural plate, so or UFPs. I'll, I'll probably use that word a lot because that's what I'm more used to. But yeah, U-shaped flexural plates. Um, and if you, you know, cut a cut a clip, a paper clip, cut a chunk of that and look at that little U, that's really what we're talking about in a bigger scale. And that in the walls, as the walls move and the walls rock back and forth, those UFPs can deform and that's how we dissipate energy. So in our phase one of testing, where we have those walls, we have those energy dissipators at all the stories. So we call that distributed energy dissipation mm. over the height of the building. Um, and so that's one aspect. Those walls are post-tensioned. So not only do we have the energy dissipation, but as part of our resilient design, we want the walls to recenter after big earthquake. And... Um, I have a prop here. Let's see how that works. Oh yeah. Um, probably, probably here. Um, which 
I don't know if you guys, if you guys looking at this or hearing this podcast uh, have seen these toys before, but you know these are mainly done so that you can push a button and um, and the building goes down. But for us, it's really you could push on the building right due to earthquake loads, for example, and due to the cables that are inside, or in our case, we have post tensioning, the building recenters. That's very basic concept that we have for the post tensioning rods that allow the building to recenter. Um, so that's phase one. Um, you steel flexural plates, the little bottom of the clip. Um, phase two. Phase two has what you mentioned, the buckling restraint braces at the ends. But there we're only putting them, there's still our energy dissipation mechanism, but it's only on the first story. Mm. So instead of distributed energy dissipation, we have concentrated energy dissipation on the first story. And that's really where the research question is, because as our buildings are tall and there's dynamics of the motions, um, can we have similar performance if we concentrate the energy dissipation versus if we distribute it? Um, and so that's really why we have those two designs is to assess impact of distributed versus concentrated energy dissipation. So, so looking at, you know, cause I imagine there's, there's pros and cons of, of both design philosophies of, you know, the distributed, you have less of a single point of failure, but it's also, you know, more construction time and more manufacturing time and materials versus concentrated mm -hmm. of, yeah, if you have one of them fail, then it's a big deal. Uh, but if it's uh, able to handle the design loads, then it's less, you know, cost to construct and install and, and probably some right. other things, but, right. um, and sounds like overall, like, um, you know, that, that concept is kind of like a shock absorber on a car, right? It's just absorbing those bumps and then, you know, turning it into heat, uh, or, you know, deforming a material rather than breaking things. Yeah. Yeah. So controlled damage, right. And that control damage, um, in, specific locations in the building um are we also call them sometimes structural fuses mm. um like you'd have you know in a breaker box you have a fuse so you know if you can go and replace your fuse um all of these elements yes that's a goal as well as after a big earthquake they have some damage the building is still functional but we can go and replace those structural elements uh, those structural fuses yeah which is much easier to replace than the entire wall or the roof or right. <laughs> all the exactly. windows in the building. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and exactly. We've been talking yeah. a bit about here. I mean, and in, in Eugene and, and, you know, where you're normally at in Corvallis, like, okay, what's, what's going to happen to, you know, normal houses and, and apartment buildings and things like that when, uh, you know, the Cascadia earthquake happens and we are just, yeah. our, our normal conversation over dinner with our, uh, my, my son's hockey team and parents were like, okay, like what is going to happen? Like some of our houses are going to be uninhabitable for a long time. And, uh, you know, if you live in a, in an older, um, you know, apartment building, a lot, I mean, a lot of the buildings downtown Eugene, even in the university are not built to absorb energy and concentrate the damage. It's, you know, brick and concrete and it's going to fall. So it's, it's really good to hear that, uh, you know, there's really smart people looking at stuff like this. Yeah, and that, that's our goal, is to provide these solutions. We know that as a community, things are going to take time to change, right? There's always many other things, but at least we want to provide solutions, hopefully are good solutions for the future, you know, sustainable and resilient. Yeah, yeah exactly. So you talked about kind of the first couple of phases of, of this project, um, you know, first looking at uh, the UFPs and then the BRBs, and then the third phase is a bit more involved, uh, with adding some resilient steel frames. So how does this differ from the the approach of those those rocking walls and the UFPs? Right. Um, so one thing that this resilient steel frame does not have is the post-tensioning. Uh, so it does not have that self-centering capability um, there. But um, if, if I were to say, it, it's probably closer to traditional solutions that we may have seen. What I mean by that is there's steel moment frames, there's steel brace frames where you see the br diagonal braces in the steel building um, going up, especially in, in earthquake regions or even for wind loads. 
Um, here, this resilient frame is actually, it combines those two aspects, the moment frame with the brace. So it's a moment frame slash concentric um, uh, brace frame. And um, what we're, what's new um, uh, is that we are providing specific locations where there's energy dissipation. So in the brace, we provide energy dissipation at the ends with structural fuses. Um, they're not UFPs, but they're slightly different design for uh, yield links at the ends of the braces where yielding can happen. And then instead of, for example, in a typical brace frame that still you know, takes the deformation, the brace absorbs the energy, and then you'd have to replace the whole brace. Here, you will only have to replace the yield links at the ends. Ah, um, okay. So they're so again, just slightly that's a structural fuse. less stiff material than the rest of the brace so that it, yep. it you design and, and control uh, where that the can brace yield. is going That it, we, we control where it can yield. So what's the elements that we can replace? Where, where are our structural fuses? Um, so it, it would be a relatively small piece that you'd have to take off and put on. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one aspect. And on the beam to column connections, also we have yield links. Mm. Um, again, so those are structural fuses, but very concentrated structural fuses where the damage uh, could occur. And that's what we replace. Um, but by combining these two systems, um, the moment frame and the brace frame, uh, we can also reduce the drifts. So even though there isn't post-tensioning, the design is such that the drifts are smaller. So with small residual drifts, people can still go back uh, and resume their lives and then replace those structural fuses um, and get back you know, smaller um, recovery times, which is the goal for the functional mm -hmm. recovery. Yeah. So, so it sounds like... Um, um, the other, one more little detail yeah, right. on these frames, sorry, Dan. One more little detail um, is that most of these frames built today have a lot of welding. Mm. And, um, you know, there's some challenges also with that, especially for repairs and recovery. recovery. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of the, the connections in this design have many bolts. But that's because we can, again, take off parts, put in new parts. Um, so it just makes it easier to repair if there is damage after a very, very big earthquake. Yeah, that's that's a really good thing to hear because, you know, I mean, anybody who's ever tried welding before, <laughs> you know, it's not a trivial thing to cut a piece out, to re-prepare it for welding, to weld it back in, especially if you're in a uh you know post damage um uh, event you you, know, you may not have power to weld um mm -hmm. but you know a couple of guys with a big impact driver to take out some bolts and put new bolts in that's a lot more feasible yeah. um after a, a really large earthquake event yeah, exactly so it's um you know for anybody listening who's in construction that should be music to your ears <laughs> it's like you know, the, the normal criticism we get as engineers is, ah, oh, you know, the, you know, the construction guys or the mechanics for, you know, on the automotive side, like, oh, the engineers never think about how we're actually going to build this thing or fix this thing. But you are thinking about that. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the we on this project, it's, it's, it's really we, it's a big collaborative team um, of researchers and our great, amazing industry partners. Um, so part of our research um, is also making sure that things, exactly what you're saying, Dan, making sure that things are as practical and applicable as possible. Of course, we have all the research um, that we're doing as well, but working very closely with industry, we hope that we can get closer to practical solutions that can be used here in the, in the near future. Yeah, and that you know kind of goes to show that all all the partners on this project, as well as just the the, the staff at, at UCSD. I mean, a lot of the techs have been there for for years and have built a wider variety of structures than most people in the construction industry. <laughs> yes, for sure. So we have yeah. some. We had uh, the contractors working with us. Um, they mentioned, you know, they 
it may take a while before they do something like this again, um, because they were, you know, in the forefront themselves of trying new construction technologies. And so they were excited to be part of the project as well. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It's it, it's really fun to see, you know, people who are excited about this and, and have an expertise and go, wow, I can't wait to do this again, to see, see this in the real world, um, like all of us, right? Um, so kind of rounding third for home here, this is a, a complex, the converging design project multi, is a multi-dimensional, multidisciplinary research project. We've got everybody from engineers to industry, uh, construction to geotechnical people involved. Um, talked about kind of the, the ultimate goal is to see this hopefully out of sight, not too far from here. Um, can you talk a bit about the outcome of the project and how is this going to change the way that uh, seismic design and engineering and architecture are, are practiced? Right. Um, I think we have we have um, different tiers of goals um, and you know maybe hopeful outcomes, but things that we we really really believe can be achieved. Um, and one uh, and this is both the ten story and now the six story. Uh, especially with our resilient designs. One of the, the I'd say, near-term goals um, is to actually develop um, a, a new line in the code but the, that will allow us to use resilient, self-centering rocking walls as part of the building code. Mm. So, um, Because that will really help anybody else in the U.S. Um, and really help all our jurisdictions to adopt rocking wall systems, post-tension rocking wall systems. So that's one very tangible impact that we hope to have here in the short term. Um, and the testing that we're doing, again, both the 10 story and the six story, plus additional work that um, colleagues um, from industry and from Colorado School of Mines are working on, um, we hope to have that impact. Um, the other one, which is maybe more broader long-term impact um, is really to bring sustainability into functional recovery. So as part of the project, we are we had a series of workshops already on functional recovery, a series of workshops on sustainability, and we're bringing those concepts into this new design paradigm. Um, so working with our colleagues, working with our industry partners, with these consensus building workshops that we've been having, we hope to have a converging design methodology that can be used in the future. Mm -hmm. um, of course, there's gonna be more lessons learned as more people start adopting it, but we do hope that it sets the stage for this next new design paradigm mm. that we've labeled converging design. Yeah, yeah, it's really, really amazing to see. I mean as most folks who are, you know, somewhat tangentially related to things like civil engineering, know, like getting something into building code is not a trivial effort. Um, you know, we're hoping that it'll be less than the usual 10 years to get it in there, but it, it may not be. <laughs> it may not be. Um, and maybe uh, some other points that I would add in terms of impacts, which are maybe not as small as that, even though it may be on two, three, four, 10 people, um, 10 students that have worked on this project, um, I, I do hope that they will be having impact in terms of everything that they've learned. Yeah, um, I can foresee that some of them, they will be 10 years, 20 years, 30 years down the line. Maybe when you and, Dan, you and I, Dan, are thinking about retirement, <laughs> they'll be the ones pushing on the new sustainable functional recovery yeah. design. So I do hope um that that would be a, a good outcome as well is that we're training all these students um to be our next uh, our next engineers right um working forward and moving forward well our, and that's a good point and, and honestly this is like really kind of real time for me as well i mean um as these students are are getting into the workforce and buying their first house building their first house you know they might be more likely to look at like, well, what about a cross laminated timber structure if I'm able to, to afford such things? Or if I'm not, I'm going to work towards making it more affordable, more accessible for people to be in these resilient, 
sustainably built structures. Um, and how do we encourage engineers, yeah. architects, practitioners to, um, you know, increase that supply so that it's, it is more affordable than, or at least mm -hmm. comparable to a, a house that you could buy that's existing, uh, or building a new house you know, with conventional construction methods is you know, just looking yeah. at, at the moment, like, yeah, it's a fair bit more expensive. Like, you know, we were just comparing with, um, you know, a, a small ADU in the backyard here in, in Eugene, if you were to build it with cross laminated timber, it's a good percentage more than, you know, just building a stick built, but right. you get all those, all those benefits on the back end. Yeah. And, you know, we're providing solutions that, you know, fit different markets as well. Um, which reminds me, um, one of the other outcomes that I do hope is there's, as I mentioned before, there's this very big industry collaboration and presence in our project. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, our, our partners have spent a lot of time looking at gravity connections that are in the tall wood building, um, in the 10 story and the six story version. And those have gone and sustained over 200 earthquakes right by now. Wow. So there was a lot of effort that our industry partners put in to develop those connections. There's many other connections in the building, but I just talked about the gravity connections, co column to um, beam connections in the, the rest of the building. That's not the primary piece that we were talking about in terms of design, but that industry collaboration, the solutions. So I do hope that, you know, these new products are going to be out there for others to use but that have been tested and that are ready uh, to go into practice. So um, again, some of these, like you were mentioning, some of these may be more expensive or less expensive. Some of these may be still need another phase of design, but um, working with industry has been fantastic. And I, I do hope that it brings our outcomes closer so that people, everybody, you, you know, your neighbor um, that is doing the ADU others can use as well. Yeah. Um kind of wrapping up here like if if someone's listening is like wow i'm an architect and i'd love to like collaborate on a project or be part of what's going on here how would they go about getting involved in uh, kind of the next phase of uh either converge convergence design project or another project down the road with uh, the Tallwood design institute or or your uh your team at osu Right. Um, so you already mentioned um, we have a website uh, at the Tallwood Design Institute where folks can see all our partners and so can reach out to us um, or can reach out to our various industry partners, depending on what they're asking. Um, I imagine, well, I'll send you the link if you don't have it, but I imagine you have the link and you can share well, later with the podcast or within the comments. Um, yeah, just reach out, reach out to us and we're happy to um to tell you more about what we've learned, we will be here um, for another month and a half. So it's early February now that we're talking, Dan and I, but uh, through the end of March, we will be here on site. So folks are welcome to come and visit. Um, we have many architects, many folks from Southern California come and visit. And we've had um, different industry partners that have had their own day where they bring their their clients and they're being their, their people that are interested in looking at how these products can be used. So reach out, reach out to us and we'll, we'll do our best either ourselves or connecting you with the right people. Great. Yeah. We'll make sure to put those, those links in the show notes for this and um, we'll be getting it out hopefully soon enough to let people be able to listen uh, beforehand. I know Marty does a great job of even before podcasts come out of, of uh, communicating well. So um you know, we'll make sure to get uh, get those links out in, in a timely manner so people can uh, take advantage of uh, your time that you've got down there. And uh, yeah, as always, just good to see you, Andre. Looking forward to uh, getting back good together to when you, you're Dan. up uh, north again. And uh, hopefully you get some sun while you're down there. <laughs> yes, for sure. For sure. Thank you, Dan. Thanks, Andre. Thanks for listening to today's episode of Design Safe Radio. Be sure to like and subscribe on whatever platform you happen to be listening to this on. It really helps people find our show. Thanks to our amazing sponsors, the National Science Foundation and the NARI Network Coordination Office, which is award number 2129782. 
Big thank you to Marty Lachance, our guest booker and topic researcher extraordinaire, and Raquel Ruiz, who is our video and audio editor. I'm your host and Nary Facility Scheduling and Operations Coordinator, Dan Zaner. We'll see you in the next episode. Until then, stay resilient.